Many, many thanks, Rob. What a gorgeous song. I couldn't help but think of my home church when we were growing up. That was one of the favorite songs that was sung there. And my dad in that choir, who's now gone, but what a joy to, to bring back those kind of memories. So thank you. As we gather this morning, I'm pleased to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, here in this place where we strive to be united in seeking God's will and in serving all people. There are pew pads on the center aisles. Be sure to fill those out as, and pass those along as those will help us in our time together. Again, we welcome all who are gathering with us in person as well as those that are turning to us online this morning. I'm aware that a number of our folks that are normally here are not here today due to colds and also COVID. And so we're down in numbers for those kind of things, sadly at a season when families are gathering. The month of November is, is when we traditionally gather uh, and collect monies and, uh, thanks and, and food for our Thanksgiving baskets. And we had done that. Those are all collected and were handed out. Uh, when we handed one out to a family here in our preschool, uh, one of the other families that was to receive one, when they, when they came in, they said, we no longer need one. Somebody has helped us out. And, uh, and then so the staff thought, well, I wonder what we can do with this. And they thought, we have another family we think that, could appreci that would appreciate this. And it just so happened that dad was walking in with his child a few minutes later, and they said, would you like? And he started to cry. It was a wonderful gift. So thank you to many of you that have been contributing to those things. Uh, our vision team, is, is where some of the work that they were doing was finding out how many folks in our immediate area and around and in our uh, area are, hung, are, uh, are hungry and for lack of food. And so we've been starting a, a, a kind of a rough draft of a food pantry. We have food out in our, in our hallway assisting those families that are coming in uh, during our preschool times and food has been going out. And so we're going to be starting a food pantry. We're not sure how it's going to unfold. Uh, but anybody that wants to make contributions of food and or monies, we, I can guarantee you it'll go to a good cause. And so we're, as we're still collecting for things like that. Um, Stephanie, is, uh, we're now transitioning into Advent and Christmas and the new Bible study. Thank you, Pastor Sam. Of our father in faith, Karl Barth, said we should live with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. I think now he would say the Bible and the phone in the other. But in any event, we in our faith try to hold those two together. And the good news is that Jesus is coming. Maybe not physically as he did 2,000 years ago, but surely as we gather to study the text and to see its application for us. So starting next Sunday at 9 o'clock, which will be an hour earlier for me, we're going to do a Bible study using Marcus Borg's book, uh, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan's book, The First Christmas, but basically Matthew and Luke. So I hope all who can be here will be here. Haven't figured out yet how we might get some notes to those who are online, but we'll work on that because Bethel is certainly a church in progress in many ways. So I hope to see you. Nine o'clock, the coffee will be hot, right? And that'll be in our fellowship room again, just adjacent to the coffee and the donuts. So. Let us now worship God this morning. Turning to the call to worship. God has gathered us to this place where we hear those stories which show us what the kingdom of God is like. God summons us to this place where we can learn how to serve our God without reservation or hesitation. God will send us from this place to tell others of God's hopes and dreams so they too can choose to follow God. I would invite those who are able to rise as we sing, God is here. You can find it on pages seven and eight in our bulletin.
be seated, please. <clears throat> if you would, please join me in the prayer of confession. <clears throat> Lord of creation, we confess that we have squandered your gifts and used them as if they had been given for us alone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for our joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now hear these words of assurance. Hear the good news. We have not been faithful in all things, but our God still welcomes us with patience and kindness. Therefore, as people of God's promise, let us receive forgiveness, embrace hope, and faithfully respond through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Glory to God. We are forgiven. We have hope. We will respond. Amen. Unfortunately, Lisa Scales is ill this morning, so we will dispense with the children's message. And this morning's scripture from the Gospel of Matthew continues the story of Jesus preparing his disciples for his death and physical absence. Through this parable, Jesus is encouraging his disciples to make the most of the resources they have. From Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one just a single one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. At once, the one who had received the five talents went off and traded them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into this joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I know that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. 
You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gathered where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, while this may seem harsh for the third slave, deemed useless and banished to the outer darkness, understand that Jesus is about to die and will soon be there as well. The good news is that Jesus stands with those that are on the outside, in the dark, as well as those who are blessed. Thank you, Ron, for sharing the scriptures and also that bit of commentary at the end as well. Thank you. Let us bow our heads now for a moment for a prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if you're new to our congregation, I know we have some visitors today. This rocking chair is not always here. I bring it out on a couple Sundays periodically, not quite once a month. And when I do so, I do so in a way to the image to invite you to my front porch for some wisdom this day. So, settle in, join me on the front porch. This is Mark's, this Sunday marks the last Sunday of the Christian year, of the church year, and we start a new, new year around as we begin with Advent next Sunday, looking towards the birth. But this Sunday, in one sense, is a culmination of all that's going on the last 52 Sundays. So I want to draw your attention to the cross up here. It's not a crucifix. This is the risen Christ. So that's not the crucifix from that what we call Good Friday. This is the risen Christ welcoming you all in with open arms. And you're too far away but maybe after worship, if you have time to come up and take a look again, at the foot of Jesus, underneath where his feet is placed, there's a carving of a pelican over a nest. There's three little birds in that nest that I can see. That's an image of the beloved community that Jesus is building. We're the ones in the nest. We're the ones being fed. We're the ones to which he's giving life. That's the culmination of the year. As I was thinking about that, that year, I remembered a, quite a number of years ago now, it's probably been more than 20, it wasn't quite at this time of year. I think it was a little bit closer. Maybe it might have been in January of the year. My home in that town was about two blocks from the church. And so on Sundays, I always walked because I knew I seldom needed to go anywhere after church other than home to eat lunch. And so I always enjoyed that walk. It was a quiet time. Nobody was out at that hour. We had two services, so this was quite early in the morning. But I remember the f one morning, the snow was on the ground, and it was just glistening, and it was quiet. You know, like diamonds again, and the snow glistening. And I was thinking, what a beautiful day. 
So I made sure when the announcements began that I began my Sunday morning with the announcement, what a beautiful day. And everybody was in agreement. At least everybody that tolerated the cold was in agreement. The next Sunday, there was hoarfrost on all the trees that morning. And it was thick. You know what hoarfrost is? Where it's that moisture that clings to the trees. And the sun was just up just at the right angle that it looked like the trees were full of diamonds. What a beautiful morning it was. And so I began my announcements with, what a beautiful morning. And again, everybody that didn't mind the cold was all in agreement. The third Sunday came along. It was cold. It was damp. That kind of chill that goes right through you no matter how many clothes you wear. I had two people come up to me that morning before service and said, there's no way you can say it's a beautiful, beautiful day. And I thought, they don't know me. Because you give me a challenge, and I will rise to the challenge. And so I began that service that morning with, what a beautiful day. Of course, you heard all the groans, and there were a number of groans. But I found something beautiful about that morning. I did that the following Sunday. I don't remember when I quit doing it. I did at least three months, maybe more. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was more than that. Because about three months in, one of the women in our congregation, she was in her 50s. She and her husband had a wonderful marriage. They had a lot of fun together. They were looking forward to growing old together. And he had died that summer of a massive heart attack. Right out of the blue. Three months into my saying, what a beautiful day. She came up to me one day after church. And she said, thank you. Because you've said that Sunday after Sunday, it's given me a new outlook on life. And now I can say, what a beautiful day, as it helped her to work through her grief. Little did I know with the power of the Spirit is about doing. Years later, I was no longer serving that church, but our paths crossed. And she reminded me of that greeting and what it continued to mean to her. It's how we perceive the world it can make all the difference in the world. So I think a piece of the scripture I'm going to unpack here in a bit. I also thought I'd share another story from my past of somehow, sometimes when we have the inability to see what's right before us. When I was uh, in college, I had a chance to go to Europe and to visit my girlfriend, now my wife, Ellen, but while I was going there, before I went, my mom said, if you go to, and, you're gonna, and I was going to go for about seven weeks, says, if you go for that length of time, you need to go, you will go, not need to, you will go to Switzerland, and you're going to visit our relatives. That wasn't high on my list of things to do. 
But I spent a week there, and it was a wonderful experience. In fact, because of that week, I ended up spending five months there working on a dairy farm for one of my relatives, distant relatives. We were visiting his brother, who also was another dairy farmer in a neighboring town, and we were, they started telling me stories. Where I lived in Schaffhausen, Switzerland, with his family, their style of home was the house and the barn were connected to each other. You walked right through the kitchen, through the mudroom, down into the cow stalls. And we lived on the edge of town. And so he had cowbells, I think Switzerland, but he never, but the cowbells were hanging in the garage. He never put them on the cows because the cows were too close to town and the people would complain, especially if the cows got out at night because then they'd wander through town, clanging their bells. So he says, I no longer put them on the cows. But my brother, on the other hand, brother-in-law, on the other hand, still does. I was visiting with him one day, and he was telling a story about the cowbells on that farm. He said there was one day he, he went to help a friend of his on a neighboring farm. This neighboring farm was about 30 minutes away. And so his wife did the milking that day. She was well able. She, had, you know, she worked right alongside him. Except for when, the, when it got done, and they were farther out of town, so they did have bells that they placed on the cows every day. And so as the cows were leaving the barn, they t you take the, cow, the bells off when they come in the barn because you don't want the bells to accidentally hit the wall or something and break. So the, the bells would come off and be hung on the wall. And then when the cows would go to leave the barn, they would stop, they'd wait for the bell to be placed on, and then they'd go on out. Creatures of habits. She did all that. Milking went fine. She put all the bells on, and she went to do the cleanup. And then she heard a loud ruckus going on out in the pasture. There was a lot of bellowing going on. So she looked out there, and the cows were fighting each other. And there was no way she could get them under control. They were way too much for her. She had to call her husband from a half hour away. You've got to come back real quick because we have a problem in the pasture. So he hurried back and he was able to get them under control and get them back in. The only way to get them under control was to get them back in the barn and get those bells off of them because she had put the bells on the wrong cows. And so they were searching out the cow that had their bell. And they were giving that cow what for. And they were all doing it. Now usually the bells are put on cows in Switzerland so you can find them in the mountains. That's their purpose. For on this farm, they didn't really need the bells. The pastures really weren't that they were large, but you could easily find your cows maybe over the hill. They didn't need the bells. But the cows didn't know that. The cows had no clue what the purpose of the bells were. And so they ended up fighting each other. They were unaware of the gift that had been given to them. And they couldn't see it, couldn't hear it before their very eyes. Without that greater vision to guide them, their selfish natures had taken over and they were fighting. Jesus tells this parable about a selfish nature parable also about gratitude. He told a number of parables as he was trying to share a vision of a beloved community. I can think of a pelican caring for those in its nest. So he tells the story of a man who's going on a journey and he prepares to entrust his property with his servants 
To one he gives five talents, to another two talents, and to another one. Now what's helpful to know, this is not just a small gift. A talent in Jesus' day was the equivalent of what we might earn over the course of a year. So he gave to the one five years worth of income to care for. Another one, two years worth. Another one, one. A talent today might be worth a million dollars to some. A generous gift. But the caveat was that it's given according to the servant's abilities. And two of them received that gift in the spirit it was given. They received it with gratitude. They doubled it. And they heard those wonderful words intended for all of God's people. Well done. Good and trustworthy servant, enter into the joy of your master. I can't tell you how many times as a clergy I get to say that, and I look forward to saying that when I'm doing a funeral. When I get to say that for the one who's died. Because what a joy it is to say, well done. Thy good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the master. The servant, this parable didn't end there. There was a twist. There was a third servant who came with all kinds of excuses on why they weren't approaching the world with generosity. I knew you were a harsh man. I know you reap where you don't sow. Gathering seed where you don't scatter it. And the key word here was, I was afraid. When we let fear guide us in our lives, we'll never become what God intends for us to be. His fear kept him from seeing the generosity of the master. His fear kept him from hearing those words, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. So when we come to the end of this year, my hope for all of us is that we're not going to let those fears guide us. Those fears consume us. Those fears keep us from living and being, being who we're called to be. Think of those cows that were fighting each other. They were fighting each other because they were fearful that the other cow had stolen their bell. The fear of loss, so they attacked the other. The parishioner who lost her husband as she was dealing with depression and fear of what's my future until one day she could see with different eyes what a beautiful day it was despite her loss. That's the gift or the wisdom from the porch this day as we come to the end of this cycle and we remember all the gifts that Jesus has given to us as he's welcoming us into that beloved community in this day and age, even now. Amen. Everything
of the spring, think of the warmth of summer, bringing the harvest before the winter's cold. Everything grows, everything has a season. Till it is gathered to the Father's fold. Praise to thee, O Lord, our creation. Give us faithful hearts that we may sing.
We now, Tom, come to a time of prayer, so let us now be in a prayerful spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, as you hung on a cross, your first thought was for others. You forgave the ones who ridiculed and tortured you. You accepted the criminal who hung beside you. And it was you who made a mockery of the sign they placed above your head. For little did they know that they did indeed gaze at a king. We don't need signs and labels to recognize your power and your authority, Lord. It's because we have seen the unlikely become reality, because we have witnessed you in the unexpected, because we believe in truths honed by a carpenter's son, that we dare to hope, Lord, that your kingdom has come among us and continues to come day after day among the poor and the lonely, the sick and the weary, the angry and the abused, the warmongers, the peace seekers. And so it is for those and others whose lives are touched by grief and greed, injustice and injury, emptiness and endlessness, that we pray now, trusting in the goodness and the grace that retrieve lost sheep and wayward sons, that console the grieving mothers and weeping women at a tomb, that fed aching stomachs and eager minds, that soothed the open wounds of untouchables and the throbbing scars of hatred, that laid open itself to pain, rejection, and abandonment, so that we might know healing, acceptance, and belonging. And if we catch only a glimpse of your mercy among the hardness of life, if we can sense your presence only for a fleeting moment in the busyness of life, if we can witness that wholeness happens among the brokenness of life, then we will know that your kingdom has come and we pray that your will be done. Let us be in silence for a moment. And now let us pray in the prayer that our Savior has taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would now invite those who are able to rise as we sing, Be Thou My Vision. You can find it on page 10.
Let us now dedicate the gifts of our time and our talents and our treasures. Please pray with me. God, whose giving knows no ending, we offer up the treasure that you have entrusted to us. We offer up the skills and time that you have graciously given to us. We offer up ourselves in service and praise. Receive these gifts by your grace. Multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish Christ's work of love in the world. Amen. And now as we come to the close of this worship, we come to the time of the benediction. God's blessing be upon us as we leave and return changed to our homes. May we strengthen and encourage one another in our shared vision. May the blessing of our adventurous creator God go with us. And may the blessing of the Son, who showed us how to live, reshape us. And may the blessing of the dancing spirit joyfully enable us in our renewed living. Amen. This service has ended. Your service now begins. Go knowing that Christ is with you and you can begin that service by helping us move some of the Christmas decorations. Go in peace, my friends. Amen.